all through the trial, etc. I don't have my brief in there. And like when I remember, and I was so delighted. Uh, there was the three three prosecutors, feds, and they said, you know, I heard they overheard they were supposed to be in a different room. Joey said, I'm awfully uncomfort, con, con, uh, I'm terribly, terribly concerned. Either you've got Satan himself in there, or some kind of a saint. And he said, I don't know which the F it is, he said, but whichever the F it is, he said, I feel very uncomfortable. He's sitting there as calm as a winter breeze, smiling at everybody, doesn't seem to have a care in the world, as if he knows exactly what's going to happen to everything else. So the book, book, one guy came in, he looked, at, I, I told him, I said, I was playing around, I said, would you like this one or this one? <laughs> what do you mean? I said, oh, I heard what you said out there. And he went like that. I said, listen, what you don't know is that I know something you don't know. I, said, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. It's not you. It's my boss, and he's untouchable. He's up there. And the story. Now, admittedly, I did not help the scene when I, before my sentencing, uh, when after the conviction, um, report. They kept me away over here, and report is where one guy hollers over. Any comment, Father Maloney? Uh, and they're cocking their ears and said, uh, "I said the coat, a great Irish patriarch." Today, American justice has been laid low, raped by a federal judge. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that went back to the judge. Didn't like that at all, and a lot of other stuff. And I told them to their faces. And I told the judge, I have nothing to be, I can't, the uh, feds want you to say you're sorry, and you get a couple of points off your sentence. And you'll be sentenced more if you don't show sorrow. I said, well, Your Honor, I have no, I am, I, I, um, I still possess my innocence, even though I've been found guilty. I have nothing to say. I am, I am a victim of circumstances. I don't blame you for being who you are. Uh, I am who I am. I left it off. I tried to rest about that. I said, God will be the judge of both of us someday. Didn't like that, of course, either. So anyway, in the system, I was treated very badly. I was treated as if I were more dangerous than God he would have been. For example, I was on a plane one time. Now, for no good reason, no valid reason, it was a total violation of human and civil rights. They black boxed me. They put a device over your hands so you can't move your hands from your side, even to eat. If the, during the long travel, they'd have to either feed you or take you out the black box. So one particular marshal was getting on a plane, I think it was in Oklahoma, and he tipped in his shoulder, he said, hey, 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 Pop, may I ask who you are? I looked at him, I was in my system, give him my number. Because prisons stick together. So I told him my number, uh, 2528, et cetera. No, I mean, who are you? He said, I want to be a friend. I said, does the devil make friends with holy water? <laughs> he looked at me. Oh, he said, you're a hot man. I said, well, I said, look, Marshall, I said, uh, I'm a prisoner in transit. Well, look, you said, you don't belong in that box. He said, I've been marshalling too long to know. There's something wrong about this. He said, you're here with uh, cutthroats, murderers, everything else. He said, I, get my, my, I know I can feel you not. Then as I'm getting off the plane, he says to me, Padre, if you're in my plane again, you won't be black boxed. When I got out there to Minnesota, they had me down as participated in the armed robbery of the Brinks Depot. First and foremost, there were no arms brought into it. Secondly, uh, I was never charged with the robbery. And then it said, and even though, by the way, an important element I mentioned, the court, the federal court ruled out any forever mention of the IRA or anything political to the Strictly Criminal Act, the, and they ruled that out. But the government added in uh, suspected IRA, higher up, etc., to be regarded as a high security, dangerous, etc. I was at Otisville where I was given a complete and absolute clear bill of health. They, I, I fooled them. 
I acted like, oh, well, at my age, you know, what can I do? I need special care. My, I'm an old man, etc. Oh, they tell me, figuring they get back at me, you have the heart of a teenager, you've got the, you've got the lungs of a 20-year-old, you're in excellent health, no problem with you, shouldn't be in population. And I said, you know, write that down, they did. So then, why do they move me in a private jet to their heart, to their fancy hospital near the male clinic, male clinic, nothing wrong with me. I was given what they called circuit therapy. I was in Fort Dix. I started out in Rochester, New York. I went from Rochester, New York to the county jail. Uh, from there, I came down to uh, Ordersville. From Ordersville, I went, I went uh, uh, to Oklahoma, from Oklahoma back to Fort Dix. From Fort Dix, out to Rochester. And that's the kind of stuff to do to disorientate you. <coughs> and all the time, in violation of their own guidelines. But you see, let me say this to you, um, Michael. The Bureau of Prisons is a law unto itself. They, after you're tried and convicted, they can up your time or your classification on a whim of anybody. And that's how I've treated through the whole time. I was moved in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, without any warning, by a Learjet out to Minnesota, to Rochester, Minnesota, in the wilds of Minnesota, in the freezing cold. That was to get me out of circulation, for Dix was too close to the media. This was a former real upper crust mental hospital. I mean, fancy, almost like the Ford Center, and they'd adapted it to a prison. So, to be frank with you, as a prison, it was like a fancy hotel. There was controlled movement, which means you could move from one building to the other in a 10-minute time. All you had to do was show your ID, and all day long you could be moved around, unless you were assigned to a particular job. But since most of the people there were under for a health reason, we didn't do anything at all. So you could be involved in crafts, reading. Naturally, I did a colossal amount of study, reading, and that. And they asked me to do a little teaching here and there, you know. And But they were afraid that I would indoctrinate in that, you know. Now, oh, you asked me how I got on at, 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 at Rochester. Royally with everybody. In fact, there was a woman there. She was a, a deputy warden and a, pre a psychiatrist who had owned the property before. And she used to call me aside and say, you know, I was up to her off, father me and she said, you're doing inestimable, wonderful work here. So everybody trusts you. Our most psychotic, psychopathic, everything. She says, you know more secrets in a, in a couple of weeks here than we've been able to find out in ever. And we'd never ask you to betray, because we know why. So she said, you know, how they look on you. She said, the higher up Italians who figure that if you are the Robin Hood uh, Brink's $7 million robber, they're thrilled that you're one of them and you're beaten, they're not getting their money back. If you're not, you're a victim, you're a martyr. And they even have you higher up for that. So on both sides of the fence, you're up there. Now, I'd be walking around out there and the old Italians especially, profound respect. Now, the other part of it was, the one guy, I never forget, he was big, 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 big. His brother died. And of course, the only way they'd let him out, which they might never anyway, he'd have to beg them to get out. Then they'd bring him in chains. He wouldn't go through that indignity. So he'd send respects. I fought and beat them on a very important issue. I told him, I'm a Catholic priest in good standing with my church. It is the prerogative of a priest to say his mass every day. If the Indians can have their blankets and their smoke things, if the Muslims can have their little caps and their little mats, uh, if the Jews can have the talises and the yarmulkes, I will have my vestments. They tried to deny me. I'd have to go to the public. I said, no, I am not a civilian. I am a priest in good standing. Cardinal O'Connor backed me up on the way. He, I, I could talk to him every, about every month for about 15 minutes on the phone. That drove them nuts. And I'd always zig him, you know, in a nice way. On the phone, because no one tapped. Then, at first he refused me. I 
told him, fine. I said, uh, I've instructed my family, if they don't hear from me after a certain amount of days, I'd be on hunger strike. And thing happens to me here, I said, you'll be accountable. And I said, this is a nice, quiet little place out here, isn't it? I said, how would you descend, like half the media of the country to descend on you? I said, phone call, they'll be here. So they conceded. So I got my vestments, and I would offer mass every day quietly in my cell. I did a night job from midnight till the morning. I had all the day free of my thing. It was a shared space, you know. I'd have my mass there. Then many times a disturbed person, when the copy's father died, or brother died, he came by and he said, you know, I haven't been to mass in a long time. Well, he said, um, I'd like an absolution that I'd like to go to communities for my brother. He said, um, and I'm going to call my mother. He said, can you be there by me, by the phone when I call my mother? I said, why would you want me by the phone when I call my mother? He said, I don't want to die of shock that I've gone to mass in communion after all these years. Man, that's wonderful. That's great. And word was out. They wouldn't dare to fear. He comes in my, my room, and I, I had vestments. They had to give me my vestments. I had a ceramic chalice, everything there. And as I, I used... Uh, I used grape juice with permission from the diocese is because I did not call it priest, a lot of grape juice. The only one time I had a big difficulty at my first Christmas. In the Eastern Church, I wanted an Eastern liturgy. You're not allowed to use a substitute. And the nun, she's a horrible woman, she didn't want to give me any, any uh, wine. She was referred to as the nun with the gun all over the system. She was of Polish background, and she was a nun who worked as an associate chaplain and eventually became the chaplain. And she was worse than a guard. A chaplain was never known to write somebody up. She didn't want to give me any, any uh, wine. But I beat her to the punch. She said, oh, well, so you'll have to do with something else. You won't have any isn't in mass this year, will you? Oh, I said, oh, yes, I will. I said, yeah. I said, if Jesus could turn the water into wine, I said, I'm your servant. I'll figure a way of getting wine. We write you up. That'd be a, a counterband. But you couldn't. You know why? I went to the uh, commissary. I bought raisins. A raisin is petrified uh, grape. I squeezed the ra ra raisins. I got that from a book called with God. Uh, he needed me from a priest who was in Russia as a prisoner for years. And I squeezed my uh, juice. And I had, my ma I, had, I had wine. I said my mass. I beat them at the wrong game. And I put it, unfortunately, many of the chaplains sold out. You know, they didn't stand up for the prisoners. They did their job, they got their money, and they went in. Yeah, they were government employees. What could they do? I, had, I did meet one Protestant chaplain at um, Lewisburg, which is a very interesting place, by the way. A big old Bastille, built like a monastery. And, he, and at Lewisburg, um, this chaplain, Protestant, came up, he said, me and her father, you're trapped in between in transit, he said. And I know you'd probably like to have, you know, it's coming up to Easter to do the Eucharist. I'll bring you in some, a little bit of wine, sign it. I'll bring you some hosts. And he brought me a little stall to put over his I couldn't get the full vestments. It was an amazing thing, the most amazing thing I could ever see. If a prisoner wanted quiet and you're in a bunk, you get a sheet and put it down the whole thing. And I put the sheet down, and this guy is up in an upper bunk, and he comes over saying to me, man, I know who you are, but I don't know who you are, and I'm trying to make out who you are. I'm trying to make you, in other words. Ah, don't worry about it. He was the marijuana king of the United States. And there's another guy, a cappy from somewhere. I mean, very, very top. Like the ones that, they were revered. They had a certain status. You saw it. Anyway, they moved around, the lieutenants following them around. They all come over and said to me, you know, Father, I was an altar boy. I said, what you call me? I said, we know what you are. He said, why the uh, thing? Well, I said, it's coming into a holiday. And he says, could it be that you're going to offer a mass? He said, look, my mother is very on in years. I promised her I'll eventually come back, but the circums have to be right. And he said, can I come back? 
And I said, I'm a prisoner. No, he says, you're also a priest. And the fact that they can't de deny you the offering, you said, I'd be your altar boy. He said, you know what he's going to do for Mama when I tell her that I serve Mass today? And then the marijuana king says, hey, wait a minute, buddy, you ain't having this all to yourself, he said. This is a historic moment. He said, we're taking over this drug tonight. And there we were in Lewisburg in a corner. And we had the most incredible, magnificent mass you ever did touch. Later on, I mean, all kinds of stories and not about, I mean, total fantasy, like, you know, uh, guys at the other end of the thing. What was going on back there? The three of them. There was a light around the thing, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, imagination. Yeah. <laughs> but it was beautiful. And the most important thing of all was, as Father Walter Kissage, who spent uh, several years in the gulags of Russia, in Siberia, had said, after the prisoner has lost everything. He's stripped of his personality. His name is taken away. His clothing is taken from him. He's given a totally new persona. He becomes the property of somebody else, he said. There's one thing they can't take away. They, take, they can't take God out of your life or your mind. And he's the last resort of the prisoner. 